So um, I oversee the design team at Mercury. Is there any designers here? Casey. <laughs> Woo! Thought I was going to be the only one. Um, how many of you guys have dabbled with WatchKit at all at this point? OK, a few people. You're actually um, building anything that you're going to push live just yet? Or, yeah? Nice. Um, well, I'm going to cover a few design topics really quickly. I'm going to try to rip through this in about 12 or 15 minutes and give most of the time for Steven to really touch on development stuff. So I'm going to get an overview and just kind of point out a few things that surprised me because I don't know if you haven't looked at this stuff, you may be surprised that it's not as much like iOS. So you make some assumptions that you know things are going to work a particular way and they don't. And I'll point out a couple of kind of gotcha things, and things that I made assumptions on and then found out later that I, um, I was wrong and had to go back and rework some things. So first recommendation here is, as always, read the human interface guidelines. And there's something a little new here. Um, Apple has actually provided some design resources and they typically don't do this. So if you go to um, developer.apple.com slash watchkit, there's a link um, over on this left-hand side for the design resources and the human interface guidelines. The human interface guidelines, you can get through those in probably um, 15 minutes. They're short even for Apple's uh, HIG standards, not as long as they normally are. Um, they'll give you some basic idea of what the watch get, or what what they want the Apple Watch to be, and then kind of touch on all the different points and make some recommendations. Um, and then the design resources, which I'll show you a few of these, um, it includes the, the bezel and um, the San Francisco font and some guides, as well as uh, templates, both as layered Photoshop files and as sketch files. So. Apple has never done that before, so I think that we probably have Google to thank because they had been really good about this, and especially last year at I.O. pushed out a ton of stuff for people for material design, and I'm thinking that was probably a motivation for, for Apple to do something similar. So yeah, so you've got two different um, watch sizes, and they provide uh, a bezel for both, and They've got tons of templates in here. These are all layered Photoshop files with guides and recommendations on positioning of items and the size of fonts and the color of things. So they're very, very detailed. Um, if you're used to working with, uh, with Apple stuff, you should not be surprised at all that Apple is very, very detail oriented and exactly what they would prefer that the font sizes and the opacity of different items would be. So yeah, you can see that these different little platters are recommended at 14% for the larger ones and 20% for the smaller ones. And because there's two different watch sizes, um, they even go so far as these uh, contextual menu items that you um, pull up by force touching on the watch. They give you a stroke width recommendation for the 38 versus the 42, which I think is kind of insane, but that's, that's how um, meticulous they are about this. So like I said, you've got the San Francisco font. They go through and give you all of these um, different uh, sizes. So that small category, the small column, is the default recommendations for 38 millimeter watch, and the large is the default for the 42. And all those different uh, numbers and letters, SB stands for semi-bold, and the R is regular. So it's semi-bold at 30 points. But uh, if you're plugging these in to Xcode, you're going to want to cut those in half because those are the two X sizes. Um, you've got your line width and your tracking after that. So you know they're covering the whole, whole thing there. Um, they got some alternative font weights and italic recommendations and even some display tracking tables. Uh, I, really, lots and lots of detail in those resources. So a few um, things about images on Apple Watch. Uh, 2x only, you don't need 1x Im uh, images for your Apple Watch project. 
um, provide one, you can provide one 2x asset or you can provide a 2x asset for 38 millimeter and 44. So you going back to that contextual menu icon, you can have two different sizes and this image here um, kind of shows what this looks like in Xcode. So if you only had one image asset, you drag it here or you can have one for 38 and 42. And I'm providing a little uh, naming convention thing there. I think if you name your assets this way, it automatically recognizes them. Isn't that Sometimes. correct? Sometimes. <laughs> right, right's good. Um, as far as uh, image caching on the watch, Stephen could probably talk a little bit uh, better uh, about this, but um, some kind of basic stuff here is approximately five mega megabytes per app. Um, caches are persistent, can be used uh, between launches, and when the cache is full, you have to remove existing images before adding new ones. But Steve will talk about this and, and clarify things a bit more when he gets up in a minute. Um, as far as tables, uh, unlike iOS, you must load all table content once, so you can't just load what's on screen and then request more content as you scroll. So you have to get everything at once. Um, Apple recommends uh, 20 row, rows or fewer, and that's all based on the complexity of the content that goes into each of those table cells. So the more complex it is, the fewer table cells you, you'll want to use. Um, you can use a load more button, um, that type of approach, if necessary, but Apple kind of recommends against it, even though they do suggest it, uh, that it's a possibility in their documentation. So the main thing here is just be cautious of memory. I mean, it's a small device. Um, it's not going to be a, a lot to work with. And these are, again, just more, um, more of these guides of documentation that they provide for design resources. And they provide most of these in 38 and 42. Uh, glances are kind of a new concept, something we haven't worked with before. They're a little bit different than notifications. Um, if you've seen the videos, you've heard Apple talk about these things. Uh, to give you kind of a real-world example of how glances might be used um, differently than notifications, I, I was trying to think of the best way to do this, and since we're here at, at Alumba, if, um, if you had the Bonnaroo app, you might um, swipe up and get a glance that, that shows you based on the fact that you're at Bonnaroo and it's around a particular time who's coming up on each of the stages. Whereas a notification might be pushed out to let you know uh, a, an artist that you've tagged as a favorite is about to perform. So uh, glances are optional. There's only one glance per app. Um, content in glances is non-scrollable. Uh, that was a surprise to me at first. Only one tap action per glance, so don't be fooled by um, Apple's uh, audio player that they demoed in the videos. That is their thing only. They can have multiple buttons, we cannot. Um, there's some templates I'll show you in a second. They're fairly rigid, but there's tons of them. The main thing to remember with uh, the glance templates is that there are two separate zones. There's an upper and a lower, and you can't combine those, so you can't have full screen images in a glance. So like I said, lots of templates here. This whole top row is just for the upper section. I'm just now realizing that that's getting clipped over there. Um, but this is for the upper section of the glance. And you see that there's lots of variations on different sizes for images and text. And then the lower section here, same thing. Lots of variations. So you, you've got a lot of options there, but still somewhat limited if you had an idea that you were going to have this giant image in the center of your glance. Probably not going to happen. Um, notifications. Notifications are also optional and they're template based as well. Uh, I'll show you the templates for those in just a second. Um, all iPhone notifications can be received on Apple Watch, so even if your application doesn't have a watch kit component, you'll still get those notifications on your Apple Watch <laughs> if, if you have notifications in your iPhone application. Um, there's two notification views. There's a short look and a long look view. The short look is shown on wrist rays and it's non-scrollable. 
And if you tap the short look or if you keep your wrist uh, held up for a few seconds, you'll get the long look notification, which is scrollable, can uh, provide a little bit more detail, and has up to four actions that you can tap on uh, associated with that notification. So the short look notification is very, very simple. You just have an app icon, one line of text, and the name of the app. So you're not going to get a lot of information if you, if you just depend on the short look notification. But the long look notifications are much more advanced. You've got the, the app icon, the name, this area that's, that they refer to as the sash that you can change the color of. Um, you can put some basic information here, and you can even have additional information that the user scrolls through uh, before you get to each of these action buttons. And at the very bottom of that list, if, if this scroll, you can see a dismiss button there as well. So animations. This is probably the biggest surprise. And if you go back to um, last year, a lot of designers got really excited and kind of worked ahead before Apple really defined how this stuff was going to work. So you could see some really uh, fancy things that looked awesome that are completely unrealistic. So I'm just picking on this particular one here. I mean, and sure, you know, this this all looks fantastic, um, but. I, I don't know. <laughs> not, not possible. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not possible. I don't know how, how much you guys have read about the animation stuff, but it all has to be uh, pre-rendered. Um, pre-rendered sequential numbered pings. Um, images can be included with the bundle, or they can be rendered from the iPhone app and then passed over to the watch. Um, there's absolutely no on-watch animations. No wa No animation done in code. Um, this includes blurring and basic movement. It just, you can't do it. Um, frames must be placed in order, though you can start and stop on specified um, images if you prefer. So you don't have to start on one and end at your last image. You can start in the middle and stop whenever you need to. Um, some recommendations, keep the animation simple. Um, use as few frames as possible and avoid easing in your animations um, since you can't tell when an animation has finished and timing is likely near impossible. So if you have an animation that's always going to run all the way through, it's fine, you can do easing. But if you've got like a progress indicator and you want, you want only want it to go around a quarter of the way and you want it to slow down as it gets to the end, probably not gonna work out for you so well. And we'll show it. Uh, Stephen's going to talk a little bit more about this particular example, which again is an Apple app. Yeah, so Rusty was walking into my office and he shows, they showed this at the keynote uh, at multiple ones of them. He goes, cool, I can do this? How? <laughs> yeah. Oh, crap. It's a lot harder than it looks. So I'm going to talk about how to build this sort of animation uh, yeah. when I get to the technical stuff. He's going to talk about how to build this, this type of animation except for the easing that's in this. <laughs> So uh, one more thing, and I'll turn it over to Steven here. Um, design for real data. This is a, a particular example from uh, Apple's uh, presentation. This is from the initial announcement of the iPhone, and, and Apple got beat up a little bit by the design community for this. They showed um, your contacts, and everybody had an image, and um, everybody's name was four characters long. Um, so in the real world, this is not the way the contacts are actually going to look. And so this is the way it initially was going to look. You got your 12 contacts there all with images, then you got your four letter names, and then it zooms in and the name is here. And a couple of weeks ago when they, um, <laughs> they started talking about this, they had completely changed it. So now um, every contacts uh, Dot is a different color, and it just shows their initials. And if they have an image, it will appear in the middle here, and their name is up in this top left-hand corner where they're sure to have as much space as they need for the name. So I'm going to play through this real quick. So, and it's still using the crown here to scroll through those uh, different contacts. Yeah. So. 
that's it. Just a quick little overview of some of the high points, of things to look out for on design. All right, so Rusty obviously has the designer, so his his uh, keynote stack looks like really sweet and attractive. Mine does not. <laughs> Mine's basically just notes that I'm going to talk on. I've uh, poorly chose to present on a night during baseball season, but I'm too busy after work to work on this stuff, so I'm uh, ill prepared with the presentation. Content though, I've been working on Watch Get Now full full time for two or three months for all several apps for our clients. Not just experimental apps, but like real stuff with real services. And so I, I must say I, I know it pretty well now. So feel free to stop me and ask questions as we go. Um, I quickly realized that there's far more to cover than I ever could in 20 minutes or 30 minutes. So I just sort of had to pick what I thought would be helpful. Um, the documentation is actually really good, like Rusty said. Um, all right. So in, uh, one or two of you said you tinkered with actually building them, right? Um, all right. So we're going to start with. How all right, architecture. So the watch apps, there's no uh, watch app store. The apps are actually an extension that comes along with the phone app. So at the moment, you cannot deliver a watch app unless you deliver a phone app for it to be bundled with. I have no problem with that. People complained, uh, it's fine. Uh, but nonetheless, has anybody, have anybody built any uh, extensions like uh, today extensions or any of that? If you built any extensions, part of watch gets to be really familiar with, uh, to you because you play with that same API. So how your extension talks back to the host app, same, uh, similar. They've added a few new ones, but very similar. But basically, you add it adds two new targets, and we're actually going to go. So we're just going to build something, right? I actually like to see stuff. So we're going to uh, come into Xcode. We're going to create a new project. Uh, we're going to call this project. We're going to shoot a single D application because we're not going to do anything on the iOS side. And we're just going to call it Pants. We all like pants. We're all wearing pants. So here we go. All right, so at this point, we just have a basic um, iPhone project, iPhone target, great, no big deal. Uh, to add a watch, we're going to come in and we're going to add a target. Okay, so you add uh, an Apple Watch target, and fine, we'll take all the defaults. Great, activate the teams. It basically created two new targets. It created an extension target, and it created the WatchKit app itself. Okay, the WatchKit app itself, and then they added nice little groups over here. So we have our extension. And we have the app. So here's our iPhone app here. We're just going to close that because you guys all know that really well. You have the extension part, which is all your Objective-C code running as an extension. It's a separate process from your main app, so sharing data is not fun. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but you don't, you can't just inherently write to the same data folders and that kind of thing. Uh, and then the other target is the WatchKit app itself. All that is is a storyboard and images. No code, no Objective-C, no Swift, no nothing. Well, you get a settings bundle, but all it is is a storyboard and image assets. So, in your iPhone apps, how many of you guys are like storyboard fans, and how many of you say, like, "Oh, I hate storyboards. I'd rather use only code." Like storyboards. Storyboards. So, everybody's pretty sold on storyboards. <laughs> I'm, I've always been sort of lukewarm on them for a lot of reasons. Aspects of them I like. Aspects of it I think are not good. We have no choice. So you get to embrace them for your watch kit stuff. <laughs> so uh, like it or not, you're going to use a storyboard. Um, I think that is the next thing. Yes, all right. So for those of you who have looked at it, um, it's a whole new UI stack. There's no UI view. There's no UI view controller. There's nothing. You got to learn a complete new class architecture for building your watch apps. Um, thankfully, they're very small. They're very simple. Um, and I like them a whole lot. But there's a lot of things you're going to be used to that aren't there. So first and foremost, let's kick over here to the storyboard. By the way, I'm not going to talk about glances. I'm not going to talk about notifications. Not because I don't want to. It's just not enough time. So you know, once you learn the basics, you can go read the docs on those and, and pretty much figure it out. So we're going to ignore those. The first thing that is really strange is there is no frame positionings in WatchKit. You don't set the X, Y of anything. Um, everything is basically using a flow layout, sort of like NS stack if you're in a Cocoa developer or sort of a HBox, VBox type model where basically everything is done in groups, okay? And everything is hosted by an interface controller. Interface controller is analogous to a view controller. They call it an interface controller. Great, thanks. Uh, the cool part is this is actually the most pleasant storyboard experience I've ever used. It works. Great. There's none of the gotchas from doing iPhone stuff. It being the only way, it's very, very polished and it works really, really well. So let's just start building stuff. 
So we're going to come over here and we're going to drag a group in there. At this point, we've got the group. And you can define the groups as horizontal or vertical. Well, let's leave this as horizontal and let's start dragging in some buttons. Okay? So we're going to drag in button one. Well, that's, that's, that's really big. So put in uh, number one. Uh, that's a really wide button, so you can start trying to drag the frames and we'll, we'll, can't drag the frame, why can I not drag the frame? Hmm. All right, well, let's go back up here. Can you guys see that all right up there? We're going to switch to vertical, and I'm going to drag in another button. And you can see it just automatically drops it in like any other programming environment that has any sort of HBox, VBox type model. And you can start layering those around. Two, and number three. That's not really what I wanted, though. I wanted those side by side. So this is pretty cool. First of all, those aren't even in the groups. We're going to drag those in the group. These can also be groups themselves. So we're going to remove button two, and we're going to insert a group in between button one and two. And we now have a new group in there. We're going to make this horizontal. And we're going to bring in a button here. We're going to bring in a button beside it, but we can't see it. It's all screen. Well, there's a really cool thing that they do. If you scroll through these, and I'm not going to go through each and every one of them. You do have a size down here. You can say, I want the width to be fixed. I want this button to be 50 pixels or 50 points. Whoops, that's the second button. Let's click the first one so you can see the change. Go back to fixed. And we'll say it's 50. But don't do this. Don't hard code sizes. You're just going to paint yourself in the corner. Biggest thing that took me to figure out, and I had to redo our designs maybe half a dozen times before I felt like I got it right. Because you come from an iOS thing and you define your table row heights and you define your view sizes and all this. Auto layout helps that a little bit. Um, here, don't hard code anything. Do everything as relative sizes to the parent, relative sizes to each other, or relative sizes to the content. Because then, switching between the 42 millimeter watch and the 38 millimeter watch becomes trivially easy. Like, insanely easy, it's awesome. But if you use auto layout, you are going to be familiar with some of this stuff. So actually what I want to create here, if you guys can see, is I want to create a number pad. All right? So what we're going to do is we're going to create a number pad, 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 79. That works on both 42 and 38 without hard coding any sizes. Um, so you can start to see how the, we've got a vertical box that has a button, a group, and a button. The middle group is horizontal. You start to see how you can sort of kind of flesh out a grid, right? You guys catching on that? But what we want, instead of hard coding this fix, we want to say relative <coughs> to container. But you got a you got an adjustment right here, and it doesn't label it. But what that is, that's a percentage. So I can say 0.3. I want that to be 0.3 of my parent. I'm going to set this one to be relative to container. I want it to also be 0.3. I'm going to drag in another button. And guess what? It's going to be 0.3. Point three. Cool. Now we want to set all these guys to be centered. I don't know how well you can you can see. Um, oh, you can see it better up there than you can on my screen. Cool. So now we've got three buttons. We haven't hard coded anything that are evenly spaced between the three parents. And in that group, we can control things like spacing. So we can come up here and say we want these guys really spaced out. We want them not spaced out at all. We want to have zero spacing. And so basically, that's how you control your layout. It's all about defining your groups, your vertical groups, your horizontal groups, images. Groups can have backgrounds. Groups can have controls. Here's the key. They can't overlap each other. Like, you can't have an image control and then put a button over the top of an image, uh, of an image view. You just can't. Everything has to be siblings. Your only hope there is to do it over a background image. But groups can contain other groups, and each one can have background images. And so the only way to really get any sort of image layering is to start doing tricks where you're laying groups on top of each other and setting all of their background images aligned so that it looks like they fit together. So back to that three thing animation. Guess what? That was three background images with three animations, and the controls didn't happen until the middle. So it's like you can. You can group them, but as soon as you start doing layout, layout, layout controls, you can do no more layering. So your controls are basically always the frontmost, and you can have several parent groups where you can layer background images. It's terrible. So you hope the designs are quite simple. Anyhow, so let's do this again. I'm going to get rid of this button. I'm going to get rid of this button. 
So I have this one group. We're going to copy it. We're going to paste it. And we're going to say this group, the three rows, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to say the height is relative to the container. And we're going to say it's 0.3. We're going to say you are height is relative to container. 0.3. You are also height is relative to container. We're gonna run this here in a second. It takes and getting you. Oh my gosh, I'm not the right one. Height. So now let's actually run this thing. By default, it's gonna run it in the simulator with a 42 millimeter. If it ever runs, did it run? Did yeah. All right, so you can see we have nice, evenly spaced buttons there that are a third of the parent. And we can change the hardware to the 38. And of course it doesn't run, so you have to kill it and run it again. And then now we have a 38, you can see the spacing is all even. It all works great. Now, what if you decide that you want the gap different on the 38 millimeter? Well, this is the coolest part of the storyboard. So let's come into here and let's just pick the top row. And you guys remember the spacing thing where I, where I controlled that, where I crank the spacing way up or way down? Can you guys see that? Let's say that for the 38 millimeter, see this little plus over here? Every setting in the entire storyboard, you can click that little plus and then customize that setting per device size. So I say I want everything to be identical on both sides except for this one gap. I want this one gap on the 38 millimeter only to have a 13, which is giant. All right. So now when I run it on the 38, which should be what we're still, you can now see we have giant gaps on the 13. But if I change the hardware to the, excuse me, 38 to the 42. There we go. You can see the spacing is back to the default. Now for margins, that's actually pretty huge because what we found is most of our layouts, the difference between 38 and 40 and the 42 is usually a point or two on a font size, maybe a margin. So you may say this is going to be a 17 point font on 42 and make it a 15 on the 38. And as long as you do that, you don't really have to change the layout at all. You might want to use a heavier font if your font size is a little smaller, but you can basically change anything per device. But we have found just a few margins and a few font sizes, and our design works both on 38 and 42 really effectively. And you can do it all from the storyboard. So this whole premise of having your code completely separated from presentation is actually viable here. And in fact, it's the best way to do it. If you start from code, hard coding all this stuff, you're going to be in a world of pain really quickly. So uh, I can honestly say there's in our, we have a pretty big app I've been working on for a couple months, and so there's not a single hard coded number in any of the code anywhere. It's all storyboard driven. Now, it took me about five iterations to learn how to do that because you do it wrong, oh, you do it wrong, you do it wrong, you do it wrong, and you're like, oh wait, no, I like that, and then you improve on that. So it takes a little bit of practice, just like your first iOS app did. I'm sure you'd look at that and be like, oh my god, that's horrible. All right, so that's a quick thing on the layout. There's switches, there's sliders, there's labels. I'm not going to go through all those. You guys can look at the docs on those. The only thing I'm going to note on those is they are write only. Once you send a value to these, you cannot read it back. So for those of you who uh, don't like double bookkeeping, like storing whether a control is hidden or not, instead of just looking at the control and asking it, you have to keep up with it. Did I hide this button? You gotta keep an eye bar to remember whether you hit that button or not. You can't, you can tell the button you're hidden. Then you can't ask the button, hey, are you hidden? Everything is right only, which is bizarre. And that makes you think a little bit different about how you write your stuff, but nonetheless, it is what it is. All right, everybody with me so far? I know I'm going really fast because there's just not enough time. So next we are going to go to, um, oh, I kind of skipped over kind of an important part. Did you guys pick up on the fact that if there's no code in your watch kit bundle, it's only a storyboard and only assets, then where do you think your code's running? Is your code running on the watch? No, your code's not running on the watch. Normally it doesn't matter, but there's one critical aspect, and that is how performance works. All of these views are rendered on your phone and sent over Bluetooth to your watch to present when it's asked for. They aren't stored and, and computed and running on the watch. That's why the complexity drives how fast these things are, because it's got to pre-render all that stuff, send it over the watch. 
um, images. If they're not baked into the watch bundle, dynamic images like poster art for the song you're playing, if you send a ping over the watch, it can take two seconds just to send that one ping. So all of a sudden, you're gonna find yourself using JPEGs again. Because it's honestly, sending a JPEG through NS data, highly compressed, is significantly higher performance for watch kits. So all of a sudden, we're using JPEGs a lot in our uh, app. We haven't used JPEGs in years. But we had to because it had a huge impact on how fast it could send that image over Bluetooth to the watch. So we're all of a sudden doing our coding, encoding from a UI image, writing it to the shared container as a highly compressed JPEG in an NS data and then reading it back out. You can actually send NS data directly to the images here. So a background image, you don't even have to convert it back to a UI image. As long as it was written that way, you can read it right in from disk or right in from memory and send it right to the control. That's probably the fastest way to do it is you never even touch UI image. Either use the image named because it's in the bundle or you send it as a JPEG NS data and keep it as that and send that right to the image control. Those are going to be your highest performance. Uh, and that's not just in the simulator. We've actually, have you guys gotten any invitations from Apple to go out to their labs and try it on the hardware? You might not have seen that. Well, they've been sending out basically to most all the developers. It's not secret. They send, they just, <laughs> they have all these labs set up and they're sending it out to any developer saying, hey, if you want to come out and test your stuff, you can. You schedule a day and they'll give it to you. And we've had some of our team members doing that. So we've actually gotten to have some hands-on performance and it's slow as Christmas. This device is just slow. It's just really, really slow. Um, so don't let people like Rusty design really fancy things because it's going to be slow. <laughs> I can't design fancy things. That's good. That's, that's an excellent point. I forgot about that. Um, so that kind of got me into the next uh, topic, but and I don't, I, I do not believe I brought the things I was going to show you. So um, I'm going to show you essentially how we would build that animation that Rusty showed earlier. This guy. So you look at that and think, all right, if I can't layer images. Um, and I need to be able to drive those separately. How am I going to do that? So we can actually nest a group. So now let's, let's delete all these. Okay. So all we have now is our top level group here. And we want to say that its size is relative to container. So it's full. We now have a full screen group. Okay. Well, I can drag another group into that. And I can say it's relative to the container. So now it's full screen. And I can drag another one in. We had three colors in that animation, right? We had the move, the exercise, and the stand. So we've now got three groups that are all full screen, size to relative to container. And let's just call this, come on, get in there, please. Why aren't you renaming? Well, it'd be easier, there we go. Red group, green group, or green, also fine and blue. So Rusty would then give us a set of pings for each one of those independently. But he would make sure to position it where it needs to be. So he'd give me a full screen ping because I can't position the ping. So they're all full screen and it's all transparent pixels except for where the red is, where the green is, and where the blue is. And then you do the flipbook animation. So each one of those, let's say that he gave me 60 frames to get it from there to full. Okay, so I now have three animations, each with 60 frames, and they're all called red 1 through 60, blue 1 through 60, and green 1 through 60. So I come in here, and I set the background image. Right here, do you guys see background? So I'd say red underscore. I don't put the number. Okay, all I have to do is say red underscore. Here I'd say green underscore. Here I'd say blue underscore. Okay? Those three are laid on top of each other. So from code, with an ID outlet, just like you would do a view, I could say, I need you to animate red's background from frame one to, what is that, maybe 40%? So I'd say, uh, so what's 40% of 60, so like 15. So I'd say, all right, animate red from one to 15, animate green from one to 10, and animate blue from one to five. Start them all at the same time. I've got three layered images three flip books, and I just tell each one to go to a different spot, but over the same duration. I want all of you guys to take 0.3 seconds to go from 1 to 5, 1 to 15, and 1 to 25. So that's how you can get various animations, and that's how you get them layered. But if I wanted to put any sort of like control over those, and by the way, that move, exercise, and stand, um, 
would be baked into that ping as well. And as long as you did them in that order, they would layer just like that. So can I interrupt for a second? Nope. <laughs> so um, I got to thinking that theoretically, since you could control the timing of the animation, that you'd be able to figure out once you've stepped through the first um, 12 or so images, and then you could just step off the speed on, on the animation. But you don't know when the animation ends, so there's no real way to. You can tell it a duration, but there's no callback. It's not like the UI animation blocks that you get that are so nice where you can run an animation. When it's done, it gives you a chance to run more code. You don't get any of that stuff. You get nothing. <laughs> you, really, you really get nothing. Um, but nonetheless, that is how you would build that. And here is all you would have. You would have three groups. But once I start dragging in buttons in the middle, you get no more layer. So basically, your only hope is to have full screen, background, or nested groups until you start doing other controls other than a group, and then there's no more layering. Is that right? Sense? It really limits what you can do design-wise. Um, it really limits it. Uh, all right, so let's move on from that. Hopefully that gives you guys a little bit of a vibe for how that stuff works. Um, but storyboard's really good. You guys are going to enjoy um, tweaking all these settings and tweaking them to the different watch sizes. Uh, it works really, really well. Uh, all right, so we're now going to move on to the interface controller. Everybody loves UI View Controller. It's kind of the first thing you learn when you're doing iOS. I don't know how many years you guys have been doing it. And interface controller is like that, but they've solved some of the interesting pain points. Um, so the first thing that we're going to do, because I, I still think it's something that a lot of iOS developers don't know it well enough, and that's the view controller lifecycle. When init happens, when view did load happens, when view will appear happens, and view did appear, most people still don't understand exactly how those work and why and get it wrong. They're either doing stuff in init that should happen in view did load, they're doing stuff in view did load that should be in init, or they're doing stuff in view did load that should be in view will appear. It's really hard to get that really right even when you're good. Um, and all of you have written bugs by screwing that up, I promise. No matter how good you are, you've written bugs and still have them and don't realize it. I promise. So they dramatically simplified the interface controller to minimize that a lot. And it's a lovely, lovely thing. So basically, I'm just going to type these in. You have three methods that you need to know inside and out how they work and why. Um, uh, you can get an init. You get a method called a wait with context, which is something that UI view controller doesn't have. And then you get view, uh, excuse me, will activate. Okay? Or will activate. All right. These three are pretty critical. Uh, init is just like any other init of any other class. It happens when the uh, object gets instantiated. Await with context happens is much like init with coder from storyboards. Okay? That's going to happen when it gets instantiated out of the nibs that are inside your storyboard. It's all storyboard is a collection of nibs. Um, the difference is, since everything is a storyboard, this is the only entry point. It's not like, how many of you guys have like a method in your view controllers called common init? Because you may have instantiated it from code, you may have instantiated it from a nib, you may have instantiated it from a view controller, uh, from a storyboard. And guess what? Different life cycle for each one of those in different methods. And you don't want to have the same init code, so you have to have a common init method, and then your init with nib name calls common init, uh, init from coder calls common init, you know, wait from nib calls common init. Surely you guys have had that problem if you've been doing iOS for very long. Don't do any of that here because everything comes through a wake of context. And then will activate is essentially view will appear. It's the same time at that life cycle. Uh, but it's important to understand those because of performance issues. You want to be careful when you do an awake of context. Okay, and here's why. So let's go back to this guy. You can see they've got paging dots, right? So we know there are four view controllers that are presented here. You can swipe between them. It's just like a paging control in iOS. The difference here is it instantiates all four of them at once. It's not dynamic. So you tell it, all right, app, I need you to load these four controllers. It says, cool, got it. And it immediately runs the init on all four of them. And it runs the await, um, await with context on all four of them. So if you have a lot of setup code in there, page one's going to wait for a setup code on page four. So set up very, very little. Don't do a lot of image work. Don't do a lot of stuff. You know, you set up your, you know, maybe some, some variables and set up some settings. But don't do any real lifting until will activate, because that is lazy. So the will activate will happen only on the first one. 
And then, much like you will appear if you've used child view controllers, as you swipe over, the will activate will happen. So do your a little bit heavier stuff, but even then, still only do it once. So you're going to want to keep up. Have I created this expensive structure? Do it only once and will activate, because then when you swipe back, it's already there and you don't have to do it again. Make sense? Everybody got that? Uh, that's actually pretty important now. In a lot of watch good forms, seeing people screw that up. They're trying to build their tables in a uh, away from context, won't render properly, slow, don't do it. Um, so what is this context thing? We don't have that UI view controller. Hmm, well it's an ID. Well it's nothing. Apple's gonna pass you nothing there. You have to instantiate everything out of the view controller. What's cool is you can pass data to it. Something you can't do in, uh, in iOS. You can't say, I wanna instantiate this view controller. So those of you that like injecting things, you really, there's not a clean way to do injections. Everybody has their own little style for sort of injecting things into view controllers, but there's really, it's not real injection. Well, you can do it here, actually. So when you tell the storyboard, I want to instantiate these controllers, you can pass it contexts. It can be whatever object you want. It can be a string. It can be an array. So let's say I was going to present three tables. Well, I can just pass three arrays as the context for each one of those, and then my await with context gets called, and guess what? That context is going to be an array of my data. It's an awesome way to inject stuff. We have found that the contexts are generally a little more complex, so it could be uh, a complex object that has a title, an array, um, maybe a status, but it allows your view controllers to be very self-contained. If they don't know about anybody else, nobody else knows about them, and that's perfect. That's something that still most of us, including myself, never really can get right on iOS. No matter how hard you try, everything's still a little more coupled than it should be a little more brittle than you wish, and then Rusty says, hey, can you try this other design? And you're like, I already have all these properties and delegates and uh, assume this previous design, and it was beautiful until you changed it. What we've learned on WatchKit is we've gone through probably five dramatic design changes that were just design changes. They weren't functionality changes, but it may have gone from a navigation controller to a paging controller to a modal presentation to something else and it may take just a couple hours because you don't really have to change your code because this is kind of forces you to write your controller code very, very encapsulated. So whether I present it modally or whether I stick it as a third page on a page controller, my interface controller doesn't change. It's, I really did not expect it to be as good as it was and after about three weeks, I started being like, oh, all right, this, 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 this I can be down with. So that context thing is gonna take a while for you to figure out, um, let's go to dash. So we're gonna open up the uh, interface controller, WK interface controller docs. So you'll see every push, every present expects a name because it has to instantiate it. So let's do, let's do um, present. Everybody's familiar with presenting modal stuff in iOS. This is the same thing on the watch. You can do a present modal. But all it's going to let you pass it is a string. That's the identifier from the storyboard and this generic context that can be anything you want. Now it can be nil. You may have a modal that is really just more of a hey, how's it going? There's no data there. Um, we have found that actually very few have nothing. We usually have something we want to pass to that controller, some sort of value, and it works really, really well. Um, this documentation for the entire WK stack is small enough that you could probably read every method on every class in a day, if not maybe two hours. It's really small. It's great, and I actually encourage you to do that. Um, it was possible to do that in the iOS two days. You could read the entire, the entire API. Then when three came out, you could actually see and know what's different. It's so big now. There's stuff that's been there for years that I haven't seen and I've been doing it for a long time. It's not for, so for now, if you like to watch, you can know everything there is to know. So hop on it while you can. Um, there's a bunch of stuff that you're going to feel familiar with, presenting, dismissing, uh, segues, stuff that'll feel very comfortable to iOS developers. Um, so that's the life cycle stuff. Uh, what else? We already got that. All right, data. This is actually a giant topic that I'm just going to give you some pointers on what you're going to have to do. Um, if you've built extensions, you already know a little bit about this. But basically, since you're running in a different process, you don't have access to the same folders. You don't have access to the same memory space. So if you need disk access, you have to do what's called a shared container, and they're a pain in the ass. Um, you've got to set up uh, new provisioning profiles. You've got to set up new app IDs. You've got to set up um, new entitlements to be able to have both of those apps. It's sort of like doing a shared keychain. Um, it's the same complexity, it's really no fun. But basically what that does is that tells the phone these two processes have permission to write to this common shared folder. And once you get it, it works great, but there's a lot of setup to get that going. Um, so that's what shared containers are. 
Um, they have an API called Open Parent Application where you can actually ask your phone. So there's a new method now on UI Application Delegate that says um, basically handle watch kit query. I can't remember the exact thing, but it's somewhere. Um, that basically you can call from this. It will launch your iPhone app. You can query some data and then return data back to the extension. We use that a lot in the app that we're building now because we have a really pretty sophisticated data layer in our main iPhone app. We didn't want to have to duplicate that in the extension. So we basically create like a, what we call watch band. And it's a real simple API that uses, that wraps this and lets us send data commands over to our host app. It runs a query against the app database that we're using to store and then returns it back to the watch kit. So we have none of that in the extension. The extension is real, really pure. Give me the data and I'll hand it off and present it. Uh, that's worked out really well. You can also use NS user defaults, which seems really strange, but there's a new feature in NS user defaults in iOS 8 called app groups. Same thing you can do with uh, that shared container to write, you can actually do with NS user defaults. You can initialize it with an app group, and all of a sudden, two separate apps can read and write the same user defaults, and you can listen to a notification that it's changed. So let's say that you know something changed on your watch, save it to user defaults. When you do the synchronize, I believe, it will fire a notification in your extension that the user defaults has changed. You can just read those keys. That's actually a really, really good way to do it for small data sets, for simple values like a status. You guys probably saw the Tesla app that they were showing off where it's status driven, it's battery status, it's range status, it's all of these values that change all the time. They're just using NS user defaults. Their main app is keeping up with all that because it's what's synchronized with the car. And they're just continually writing the NS user defaults and synchronizing. And as the watch app is open, anytime those values change, it just updates right on the watch. It's really, really, really simple. Larger amounts of data, you can't use NS user defaults. It's like trying to use it for a database. It's terrible for that. But for small values, status updates, battery, progress, it's really, really great. Um, but nonetheless, those are your three options for moving that. There's some other ones. You've probably seen some third-party apps like Wormhole that will use Darwin notifications for talking back and forth. And you can do that, but I think it's, that's just somebody trying to be cool and just use the, good, the right way to do it. Um, and then last thing that I'm going to cover, then I'll open up the Q&A. There's a couple of tools that I strongly suggest you pay for if you don't have them. Um, Xscope, if you don't have it, is a great tool just in general for doing designs and measurements and everything on screen. Uh, but it has a companion app called Xscope Mirror. So you can actually mirror the watch simulator onto your device. And since the, both of the screens are retina, it will actually show it the actual 42 millimeter size. So you can get a really good um, feel for exactly how it's going to look on a 38 millimeter and a 42 millimeter on your phone. Uh, it positions it right in the middle. It works really, really well. Um, that's very helpful for the designers because you can't really tell in the simulator because it's huge. Uh, the problem with Xcope is it's one way. It only projects. There's another tool called WatchSim that uh, does the same thing except for it's two directions. So you can actually press buttons on your phone it projects it using Bonjour back to the SIPWatch simulator so you can actually push buttons. Now it's laggy because of the network, but that's fine. It actually is also really, really helpful um, for evaluating design. So I definitely encourage you to do both of those. Um, is that the one that takes over your mouse? I saw one where it like, was kind of, kind of a hacked together thing where it, you would press buttons and it would like move your mouse around or something like that. Uh, kind of. I mean, I'm always looking at the watch, so I'm not exactly sure what the mouse is doing on the screen. Um, but it's cool. It basically sets up a little server um, on the computer and connect to the watch. Get, oh, and I didn't listen to another one. There's another one called Bezel. That's really good. That basically lets you pick any watch face, any color, and any band style and wrap the iOS simulator in it. And then when you use that combined with Xcope, you get a really good view of what this design is going to look like. For example, the designers on one of our teams changed some other colors when they realized it looked fine on the silver, it looked fine on the black, it looked strange on the rose. Uh, they didn't have to make a dramatic adjustment, but they wanted to make a subtle color adjustment that looked uh, good on all three or all four of the, of the metal uh, color options. So it is worth seeing it on the various, I guess there's, what is it, black, silver, rose, gold. Is that it? Four colors? Nonetheless, Bezel will uh, let you preview it on all of those colors, and it actually works, works really well. Um, that was incredibly fast and incredibly high level, but do we have any, uh, any questions? I could, I could talk about this for like two hours before you guys <laughs> in tears um, and write a lot more code, but any questions? Yes. Um, so
So as far as the data sharing goes and that open parent application method, like how has the performance been of that? It's slow, just like anything, any, have you ever uh, written anything that has to wake up your phone in the background like a geofence or anything? Similar to that, so yeah. the first time it's going to be a little slow, but then once it's running in the background it's actually really fast, it's surprisingly fast. Um, so your, your phone is still going to have the same performance issues because it's still having to launch your app, so as long as your app can launch quickly in the background, you're not doing a bunch of initialization stuff, then even the first time it's not bad. If your app loads slow, then the first time you call it, it's going to be slow, and then all the rest of the time, it's actually still there in memory in the background, and it's going to run. It runs really quickly. Uh, it will time out, so if your if your thing takes too long, uh, it will just die. Um, so you gotta you gotta make sure. In fact, what Apple recommends you do is on the app side of this. If you guys, any, you know, I've written a lot of background work, background tasks. They suggest no matter how fast it is, start a background task immediately on the app delegate side, and then it won't get killed because then it can run longer than this method will run, and then your callback will always get called back. So they, they talk about that in the tips. Um, in fact, one thing that Rusty didn't point at at that site, the, uh, on the WatchKit site, there's a tips thing that they just added like about three weeks ago that is stunningly helpful as far as performance and, and best practices. It's, you know, and it's concise and relevant in ways that I hadn't seen Apple do, so make sure to read that very, very thoroughly. Um, I skipped over a lot of the development part where you, it's just like anything else where you can create outlets, wire up your controls. You guys have all done that. I'm not going to show that to you. You just need to learn what the API is for that button, which is really simple. Learn the API. Like, there's no press state. You don't get any of that kind of you know, customizability. Um, but from that standpoint, writing the code over here is the same. Didn't get into tables a lot, but tables are pretty important. Um, tables are weird. Um, that, I could do a whole session just on watch get tables. Uh, the way you instantiate them, it's in some ways a lot more pleasant than iOS, but it's also a lot more limiting. Um, but I don't want to keep you guys here all night. So, all right, what else we got as far as questions? You had any experience using the um, app group NS user defaults? No. And the reason we didn't take that route, we went the shared container route. The reason for that is a lot of our data sets are pretty big. And then what we do is the extension. You basically have to write to that ahead of time. So we wanted our app to be as fast as possible. So we do a lot of basically what I would consider pre-rendering of the data. The problem is, is it might be slightly different based on when the app itself, the watch part, is viewed. So what we do is we have our app in the background writing larger chunks of data than a shared container, much larger than we want to use NS user default. Because of that, we Use, we basically use that route for all of our data, small and big. It's a lot simpler to have one way of doing everything, small or big, than saying we'll use this for small, we'll use this for big, so that's why we went that route. But we write a lot of data in the shared container, then the extension wakes up right when they use this, and then we slice it into a thin slice and send it to the watch. But by having all that in the shared container, we don't have to go ask the host app for it, it was faster. So we basically throw a lot of data in the shared container, and then the extension can just real quickly open it up and say we only want to use the stuff that's dated within the last hour. So that's why we went to share. It's too much data to go through in a user defaults, plus it's key value, uh, which is, you know, again, everybody has tried to use that as a database once uh, and then regrets it. Uh, <laughs> so well, I, I've been doing that for 15 years, and so I knew better. So I know I've not tried. I had, uh, I had problems getting the uh, notifications to work when the values changed. Yeah, the, well, you mean the uh, NSU user default one that did change notification? Yeah. Yeah, uh, I can't speak to that because we didn't go that route. I was hoping you would have some pointers on that because I could never get it to work. Yeah, are you sure you have your group set up properly? Because that's, that, that's probably what Most it is. likely is the groups aren't set up and it didn't tell you. Um, like, for example, to get your shared, when your shared containers fail, they'll fail if you're provisioning. Because now you've got to have a provisioning profile for your app, you've got to have a provisioning profile for your extension, you have to have a provisioning profile for your watch bundle. All three of them have to have their own app IDs, they have to have their own permissions. So I'm saying it's, it's, I mean, I appreciate the links they're going to for security, but oh, it, is, uh, it, is, it is painful. But all you get is that you fail to write to the shared container if you screwed up your app groups. You don't get any useful information that, oh, you screwed up your app groups. Well, the interesting thing was the data is all there. Um, I actually wrote a, I assumed that because they were in different containers, even though they were in the same app group, that the notification just wasn't getting through. So I wrote a, 
a quick and dirty sync engine that just was an NS timer. Did you have, have you, did you play with the Lister app? Because the Lister app uses that technique. Yeah, I, I did play with it a little bit. Did um, the notification work in that? Uh, I'd go look at that, because that's yeah. probably going to be a clue. Um, I'm of the opinion that anything that doesn't work, it's my fault until I agree <laughs> otherwise. Yeah. Um, that's actually done me really well and kept me from putting my foot in my mouth when I walk up to somebody and say, hey, your stuff doesn't work. Yeah. And they're like, it does. I'm like, okay, I'm an idiot. <laughs> so uh, I would keep assuming that you're doing something wrong until you can prove it. That's um, what I have assumed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but check out the Lister app. That's actually pretty full feature, and they use pretty much about every API in the watch kit. And if it's not firing notifications, then it could be a bug. And I've filed more radars for watch kit than I have for iOS in a year because there were a lot of bugs during the beta. a lot. <laughs> Um, some really bad ones on the table stuff, and thankfully they fixed all the bad ones before the last, uh, before the public release. Um, but it could be a bug, but make sure you see one of Apple samples fail before you report it. So, what else? Any other questions? What's the thing with the five megabyte image caching? Oh yeah. All right. So you guys remember telling me the biggest performance thing is because your phone has to send all these pixels to the watch which is why you want to send them as JPEGs, right? Well, let's say that you have an animation that is a stock chart, okay? You can't bake that graph into the bundle because the data hasn't happened yet. So that's a prime candidate for doing some custom drawing, doing some quick draw work on the iPhone side and you draw your little graph, right? And you may even animate it. Say, hey, I can draw this in like 10 frames and make the line go Zoop. That's awesome. But you have to create that from the watch kit, okay? But you know that that same thing is going to be used a bunch of times on the watch for the next, because you may only update that data once a day. So you don't want to send that animation every time it runs, because it's going to be slow the first time. Well, you can say, all right, in the morning, I'm going to wake up and check Apple stock, and then I'm going to draw my little animation of the chart, and then I can push that to the watch cache. Is this in the background, or is this? You can do it either way you want. You can do it however you want. You probably want to do it in the background. You do. Right? You want to do the data work in the background, but then the point is, from your extension, you can go ahead and push all the images for your animation to the watch in its cache and then refer to it only by name. Then you could launch the watch app two hours later, and when you say, hey, play Apple animation, all you're sending from your phone to the watch is a string, not 20 images. And basically, you can say, stick this in your cache and refer to it by name. And you get about five megs of stuff to do that. So that's what's going to be really good for non-Chrome frequently used data. When I say not, you know, your, your permanent background images can be in the bundle, your button, you know, graphics can be in the bundle. The things that don't change are in the watch bundle. The things that could change, but that are used frequently, you generate from your extension, and you push to that. The things that are used like once, like poster art on a screen, I don't even bother caching it. You just send it, and it's viewed once, and the user never sees it again. So you sort of kind of have to weigh, is it worth the work to figure out how to send this to the cache and all the bookkeeping that comes along with that. Um, but that's, uh, Apple re recommends doing that because it is a lot higher performance. <clears throat> you just gotta decide which type of images are worth putting in that five megs. But the point is, if you do that, then you can refer to it by a string, even though it's not in the watch bundle. It's sort of like a dynamic bundle. You can sort of say, hey, store this, buy this key for me over on the watch side so I can refer to it only by name. Because basically, everything Apple can do so that you're only sending strings and not pixels, the faster it'll be. So that was kind of the, that's kind of the concept there. So what else we got? Other questions? Um, this might be a question for Rusty too, but uh, the short notifications, I haven't seen that yet. Like, is there any examples of what Apple's using that for or anyone else? Well, I think that it's required. That's the first part of the notification that you will always receive. You'll uh, okay. never see a long notification first. And you, okay, gotcha. Yeah. And it's going to generate one whether you have one in your bundle or not. There's the default one. Yeah. So you'll still even, let's say that I never install um, the version of ESPN that has the watch app. I stay on their older version, but I still get push notifications. They'll end up showing up on the watch. You'll just use the generic template. Gotcha. Then I upgrade to the new version of ESPN that has the watch bundle and fancy looking notifications, then it will just start using that. So it's not unlike the Pebble ones. If you guys have ever had a Pebble, you just kind of get this generic you know, notifications, that sort, same sort of thing. You didn't have to have a you didn't have to have a special app on your Pebble just to get a notification from that app on the iOS side. It's the same concept. You can just customize it if you do. Um, one thing I forgot to mention about the glances um, that I, I read about is that evidently you can set, um, you can go into settings on the watch and change whether you want 
your default view to be the watch face or the last app that you used when you raise the watch up. So if you set it to the last app that you used and um, it's really important that somebody get to your glance, it's going to be a little less convenient for them to get to it because they have to actually close the app, go back to the watch face and swipe up from the bottom of the watch face to get to your glance. So the, the glances are kind of cool, but they're so limiting. I, I think that notifications are going to be way more popular. We and, actually and way tried. Used. We tried forever to come up with a reason to have a glance, and we're going to be releasing a pretty major watch app that's just not going to have a glance because we couldn't come up. We could have put one that was stupid, but we could not come up for this particular app. There just wasn't a compelling use case for the glance, and we just didn't. A lot of people are going to do it anyway, which is just. But not a, you may not need a glance, and it's okay if you don't. Um, it, we just couldn't come up with a compelling use for it. Glances are going to be a lot more useful for apps that have a lot of statuses again. Um, in fact, we've learned that kind of across the board. Um, the watch is terrible for discovery, so it's not going to be good to like, hey, let me pick something on Netflix that I want to watch. Well, that's a terrible way to browse your Netflix library. It's too big. But it's a great way to check the battery life on your Tesla or um, you know, some, some else kind of status. Um, in fact, the, the health apps are perfect because all the health apps are, are, are tracking. It's how many steps have you done, how many um, reps have you done, what have you eaten, how many calories have you consumed. It's all status work. The, the most compelling uses I've found thus far across anybody's apps are ones that are very status driven and less content driven. Content is better on the phone. Status and quick look uh, is much better on the watch. And if you don't have a lot of statuses, you may not have a great watch app. So that's my two cents at least. I'm really excited about being able to check my Tesla battery life <laughs> from my rose gold. <laughs> Rusty, I'm paying you too much. So we'll have to have a talk tomorrow. Uh, but it's really neat. It's, I encourage you guys to, 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 if you haven't gotten into it, it's worth it. It's a lot of fun. Actually, I've had more fun in the last couple of months than I've had in a long time. Um, it's, okay. it's, well, it's not that. It, it's, it's, it is, I, personally have always enjoyed the challenge of working in a constrained environment. Um, for those of you, I don't know if any of you guys are around the iOS 2 days, but the, what, the hoops you had to jump through to get your app to perform were horrendous. It was used techniques that you guys would just be like, absolutely not, there's no way I could, I don't even understand this. I love that, to me that was fun. It was, um, it was a, I don't know, it was just a challenge. And all of a sudden, you get this watch and you're back to a constrained device. You don't have much memory. You don't have many pixels. You don't have good performance. Can you eke out something that's, that's useful? And I, I just enjoy that challenge, and it's a challenge that I haven't felt on iOS in a while. So I've had a blast. I've had an absolute blast. So I encourage you to try it. And I also, by the way, I'm happy to answer questions. This is what I've been doing now for months. So you guys are more than welcome to just shoot me an email and say, all right, I'm really confused. My designer gave me this design. And I don't know whether I can pull it off or not. Um, I've had that conversation about a thousand times. Uh, not just with Rusty, with a bunch of designers. So I'm happy to help you guys. Uh, I love doing it, so. How have you guys uh, been testing the inner device communication? Like from the watch to the phone, through the simulator? Uh, well, you can do that in the simulator. Yeah, the setup's a little complicated though. It's not as straightforward as. You can't do notifications. You can't test local notifications. And you can only test static remote notifications. But as far as all the APIs for the NS user defaults in the shared container, you can absolutely do 100% of that in the uh, simulator, absolutely. And we do that heavily. And it's, it's the same. I mean, we didn't have to do anything special. Um, we didn't have to do anything special at all to make it work in the simulator, at least not for our setup. Sure. Uh, in, in the back, it's even cooler because you can browse to your shared container. You can actually look at it really simply right there in the finder. You can see exactly what you thought you were writing the container and like, oops. I didn't realize I wrote an empty file. That's why it's not working. So, anyway, that's all I got. Any other questions? There you go.